I tried so hard. I got so far. But in the end, it doesn't even matter. I had to fall to lose it all. But in the end, it doesn't even matter. There you go. Melvin. <laughs> Rock. I love it. Linkin Park. You can't go wrong, man. That was one of the best ones yet, man. I wasn't expecting that. Awesome. Oh, Thank you very much, man. Would blast that on, like, <laughs> estimate closing day. Because, you know, it's literally, yup, you try so hard. <laughs> do they get it? Do they understand it? Do they come, like, do they get part of it yeah pretty pretty much everybody who is going to listen to that on an estimate closing day is either going to be manic depressive by the end and you got to make sure all the roof access hatches are locked um or you know they'll get it yeah i totally get it all right so we got an interesting show today you're coming from us uh from, from alberta calgary right Calgary, Alberta, actually just south of there in Okotoks, but yeah. Okay, Calgary, okay. Alberta. I think I've driven through. I'm trying to remember if I have. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna, it's a long time ago, back in my 20s and 30s probably. It's a much bigger town now. Oh, I, I don't <laughs> doubt it. I don't doubt it. Melvin Newman, here we are. So we're going to talk about Pat a bit. Uh, you, you're the founder? You started this whole yes, thing? Yes, I am a co-founder. Co-founder. Uh, okay, yeah. so triple W patabid.com. His email is melvin at patabid. On Instagram, it's patabidtech. And then you guys are also on LinkedIn under the same name, and you also have a YouTube channel. And so we're going to talk a lot about um, electrical and mechanical, which is also probably applicable to other uh, estimating as well, right? Yep. Again, I mean, yep. I, I call them the top three. <clears throat> Right. Yes, like it, when it comes to most complex and difficult, electrical and mechanical are pretty much it. Yeah, so you, and then it kind of goes up from there. You've got a killer software to help us, not me in particular, but a lot of listeners, because <laughs> I'm not a Sparky, I'm not a mechanical guy. I respect what they can do and what they can pull off, but I'm not I'll forgive them. you, yeah. Yeah, no, I know, I know. And don't worry, I don't have Milwaukee tools. Okay, so we'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at that. Oh, but. that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> is that the same thing? I'm just curious before we all get started. Is is that the same thing out west there? Is that the the HVAC and the electrical? Are they Milwaukee guys and girls? Is that the idea? Oh, oh man. Like if you right now these days, if you want the, the best bang for buck for a lot of the tools, it, it's Milwaukee. Milwaukee. Yeah. There's a lot of rigid also, which is really good. Um, but that's the crossover, the right? From rigid with the plumbing tools, which they have really yes. amazing, good tools. Yeah, if, if you're on the plumbing side, like yeah. pipe threaders and that kind of stuff, yeah, you, you go rigid. So um, we're gonna we're gonna have lots of fun. We're gonna talk about this estimating <laughs> software. We're gonna find out because you do come from the industry. I'm not yeah. speaking to a joker, so to speak. You know what I mean? You you understand you understand who we disagree. are. No, 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 no. <laughs> she she hasn't said anything negative at all. Before we begin, I want to just do a quick shout out to Val in New York, and it's his T-shirt that I'm wearing today, and it's Legacy Carpentry and Construction. He's doing amazing work in New York and Brooklyn, and he's such a passionate individual, and I love what he's done. and And I've met him a couple of times, which is great, and we're talking all the time. So shout out to him. But over to you, Melvin. How do we, where do you want to begin? Oh man, um, estimating. Like just at the big picture, it does not get, um, does not get the attention that it needs in the industry. You know, a lot of people look at project execution, um, you know, the, the PMs, the, you know, what are we doing as we, we build this project? And it makes a lot of sense because that's kind of the long duration of the project. That's where people, tend to think that they're getting their money. But the reality is every dollar you lose, every dollar you make starts at the estimate. Every oh, risk agree with you factor so much. on the project yeah. starts at the estimate. It is the, the tip, I call it the arrow of construction. The very tip of the arrow is your business development, one of those relationships you're making. Then the rest of the head of that arrow is your estimate. And it's such a tiny part of the whole length of the project because, you know, that shaft is your project execution, and then the tail feathers at the end are your turnover and, and closeout. Everybody looks at the execution, and they want to standardize on that. They want to, you know, get that right. And it's not wrong. Like you, you do need to do that. <clears throat> but the reality is, if your project is going to go off the rails, all of that starts at the estimate. And if we don't capture that and get it right, everything is just going to start off the rails. Is it Melvin? Is it our fault? Is it the tradesperson's fault? Not knowing or not being aware? <clears throat> I, I personally honestly go back to the education. Okay. Like I, I, I think that it's a trade colleges. 
um, there is not enough focus on the what happens at the front. In fact, most of the people coming out with their you know journeyman ticket these days don't actually even get told what an estimate is. Uh, I was down at NECA and I was talking with a couple of the, the guys doing training. Uh, we were down in Austin there um, a couple of weeks ago. And a few of the guys that are, are working to train journeymen and train these people. And they're like, yeah, these, these guys come out of the training courses and they're not even told what an estimate is. And I went through college for uh, mechanical engineering. And at no point was the word estimate actually even mentioned in the education. Not once? I, not once. No, nothing. Nobody raised their hand. Knowledge. Nobody asked. Nobody was curious. Nobody. No, it was wild. I didn't know what an estimate was until I started in construction. Even then, I started in project management and then <clears throat> did a couple of years of that before moving into estimating. And even after a couple of years, I didn't really actually know what an estimate was. It was the guys on the second floor that did everything in their little <laughs> hovels. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. I got to go up and join them. And all of a sudden, I'm like, wow, this is a totally different world that nobody even acknowledges. And, and the problem is a lot of executives and companies come out of project management naturally because, you know, that's, uh, that's a fairly natural progression in the industry. And unfortunately, they also have never been fully exposed to what estimating is, what it means. And that's where a lot of the bias towards standardizing execution, I think, comes from. <clears throat> um, but we really need to to take a hard look at the estimate. Yes, you know, that three to four weeks that locks you in for two to three years later is probably the most crucial and pivotal point in your whole company's existence. So, so yeah, that's that's my kickoff. Standing no, on my and, and, and it, <laughs> it opens up a whole world for us to discuss because uh, I want to know, first of all, where was it at your, what was the moment for you when you were in the industry, you're talking and all of a sudden you're realizing that there's a missing link here. Like at, at um, what point was it? Probably day two as an estimator. Really? I sat down in my cubicle, introduced all the guys in the estimating team. <clears throat> Chief estimator walks over to me and drops about 200 pieces of paper on my desk, all handwritten. He hands me a calculator, a red book, a PHCC labor manual, wow. and a pencil. And he's like, your job is to extend all of my takeoff. And I looked at this, and I'm like, oh, this is hilarious. He's like, no, I'm not kidding. I'm like, are you serious, man? I'm like, this is like 2010. Like, this is, <clears throat> or 2008. I'm like, this is, this, we've had computers for a long time now. Yeah. What are we yeah. doing I with know. We don't have horses in front of our cars. I know. Like, this is like, what's going on here? Yeah, like, this is like, you know, it, and, and technology just gone nuts since then. But um, I looked at this, and, and it was it was wild. And so, yes, I did that job, extended it all out by hand, um, immediately went home and started writing my first piece of code to automate that because I'm like, this is, this is just wrong. Now, I did it in Excel. You know, it was, excuse me, very basic. Literally. Um, and then, uh, but it worked. So the next a couple weeks later, came back and did another one of these, dropped another, you know, 100 or so pages on my desk. And I was able to do it in a couple hours instead of a few days. What was the time limit that he was giving you to, to, <clears throat> to do those? Yeah. Are usually about a week. And so after automating the process and setting up, you know, the first database of common items and everything that we use, it was literally down to a couple of hours. And then management went nuts. And I'm like, guys, what I've written here is a joke. Like this is, there has to be better out there. And so they looked and said, go find it. And so went and did that. And that's when I started to realize, wow, there is a monstrous gap in the industry. And then it just went from there because then I started to realize, okay, we do these estimates in a vacuum. <clears throat> we don't close the loop between execution and estimating. Nobody's done that properly. A couple of companies I've worked for have done, you know, a fairly good job of turnover of the estimate to execution. Um, but even there, there's gray areas. Um, it's an incredibly complicated task. And then on top of that, like the quantifying of a project is a huge waste of, of time and effort that must be done, but is also like kind of the next step of automation. Um, 
but uh, yeah, there's that, that, you know, day two of estimate was when I realized the construction industry has a massive hole and then trying to raise awareness of that. And the majority of people are just like, no, 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 we got to go standardize. I, I had a, a, a intense discussion with the owner of the company I was working for. At the time there, when you were still developing this? <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Well, when I was, uh, this was back in early on in my career. And they were starting a massive program of standardizing their project execution internationally, like across all of their, their areas. It was a very large m and contractor. Um, <clears throat> and very, very brilliant people work there. Like, uh, our managers were very forward thinking, but we had an intense discussion on, okay, if we don't get estimating right, all of the work to standardize execution is just going to give you the standard we've screwed up message. Like we, we got to get the, the front right before you try to do the middle. That's, that's been basically my whole career is championing that now and now working into the software because unfortunately the vast majority of software until very recently for estimating was effectively developed in the 80s. Um, and it's and been, it hasn't you know, been improved since. It, it really slowly. Hasn't. I mean, there's been incremental yeah. development. It was made Windows compatible at some point. That was, you know, yeah, the big That's the extent of the technology yeah. leap. <laughs> you you look at some of the databases backing this software, and my favorite one was looking at one of the one of the major pieces of software that runs the electrical industry. The database ceased being developed in 1984. That was the last version of the software that it was actually built on, like the core database implementation wow um so fantastic technology for 1984 but (laughs) severely limited for today a time of floppy disks and zip disks and zip drives oh literally yeah like the the whole database could actually fit on a couple of floppies so were, were, were they nervous were you were they nervous that you were bringing this and presenting this and and trying to explain to them that there's a massive gap here. And it's not just a one hole. I mean, I know that you're talking about just one hole for this estimating, but I agree with you. There's several holes in construction that need yeah. to be improved. And there's lots of people in the industry that can help and actually contribute to filling those holes and making new ideas come out. But yeah. were they nervous? 100%. Like there was there there was a, a lot of pushback because I've, I've often taken in my career a burn the ships approach. Um, you know, I, I love the, the line from, um, the hunt for red October yeah. where he writes the letter to the Kremlin announcing their intentions to defect. And he's looking at his second in command. He's like, when Cortez reached the new world, he burned the ship. So his men were better motivated. I'm like, There's only that, one direction. That's it. Just there, one direction. Exactly. Yeah. So I've taken that approach with any of the teams that I've, I've worked in and went full digital right off the cuff. So you get the big screens, make sure that they're set up right. You make sure that it's, you know, 4K, 48-inch screens. Get the software pre-tuned out, and then you put them in, and you forbid the use of paper. And you start at that key point. Because once you've got the data in a digital format, you can then transfer it anyway. You can translate that far easier. When it's in pen and paper, it is effectively utterly useless. It's useless. Um, yeah, it's it's literally the most impressive vendor lock-in in human history was the invention of parchment. And since then, you know, everything that's written to paper is the ultimate DRM. Like, it, it is just so deeply painful to copy. Um, <clears throat> so, so once you have it... No, go ahead. Sorry, go, go, ahead. Sorry, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, you you gotta, you gotta be careful here. Feel free to interrupt. Yeah, no, no, I, I know there's a slight little lag. On. There's a slight yeah. little lag. I've got a thought. I want to share it, and all of a sudden, but I want to continue hearing your thoughts. So, no, no, no. I, I wanted to ask you. Um, you evolved this. You worked on it. You you kind of trial and error it. Try to figure it out. Has it dramatically changed from the first time that you presented this, or has it just been perfected from the original source that you came up with? It's. Um, I mean, the the form that it takes has dramatically changed, like the software has dramatically changed. Um, the platform has dramatically changed. What I've written as, you know, part of Padabit is fundamentally different from what we started at. And I would like to say a vast improvement um, <clears throat> just in what modern technology enables right now. Um, the idea is the same. Okay. 
the idea of going 100% digital so that there is no more loss of information, loss of fidelity, loss of the drawings you marked up for your estimate, that doesn't happen anymore. Um, so there's, you know, regardless of how you, you do this, that idea is still the same. Nice. Now, yeah, what we've implemented is a 100% digital workflow that integrates, you know, aggressive AI automation, all of that kind of stuff to try to really speed up all of that lost time spent counting. So Melvin, I'm assuming you're working on other wheelhouses as well. We won't talk about those ones, but I want, I'd love for you to kind of just, let's start walking the tradesperson through this, how it all starts and how it benefits their business. And I'm also gonna, I've got the same thought that when I first was introduced to it, that this is applicable to a small business, to a large scale business, to all kinds of businesses in the in electrical and mechanical fields, right? 100%. I mean, we're, we are trying to target all trades. That includes, you know, the, the general trades um, and that sort of thing. We, we specifically targeted mechanical, electrical, because they are the most complex to go for we, from a software. Have you, have you tried tackling, because I've always uh, tried to understand, like, trim carpentry. Have you tried some of the wood trades? Is this possibly applicable? <clears throat> um, not, not yet. Like, we don't have the data loaded in from a technical standpoint. 100% yes. But that's what I was hinting at the so, wheelhouses, right? That yes, there's other things yeah. going on. But I definitely, you know, I'm not dismissing the other trades. We still want to talk to the rock stars, which are the electricians <laughs> and the mechanical and plumbers. And But I mean, okay, so let's why I'm a tradesperson, you know, and I'm pretending to be one on TV, whatever. And I've got my business going on. How does it all start? Where do we begin from there? So, I mean, it all starts with your, your opportunity, right? Like you get that request for a quote the GC calls you, the whoever calls you, then you have to set up an estimate. So what we've done here is we say, don't print anything. You know, don't, don't spit those drawings out. A, you're wasting time waiting for the printer, um, especially if you have a large project where you have to get, you know, the full set of drawings and everything right now. And can I just say um, one thing, Melvin, and do yep. not write it on a piece of wood and scan <laughs> a picture, take a photo, <laughs> and send it in a text of your scribbling <laughs> on a piece of wood or a piece of brick or a piece of drywall piece of anything. Please do not do That's that. That's amazing. That's a classic. <laughs> we know. We do it. I still do it today. I still do it, but we do it. I get it. But my favorite one that I ever saw was a $3.5 million bid done on the inside of a pizza box. No. Are yeah. you serious? Yeah, that was what, and it was done at night while eating the pizza. They submitted and won the job. And kudos to the the pure brilliant guys that put it together. They were fundamentally brilliant tradesmen, actually, who had owned their own companies. So they put this three and a half million dollar bid together, made really good money at it, but probably knocked about ten years off the GM's life. I can imagine but, that. But yeah, no, a hundred percent. Like you know. Avoid the paper. So if you're in kind of the, the carpentry, if you're in the, you know, drywalling trades, all of that, or flooring, everything comes down to, okay, I've got to get my quantities. And this actually doesn't matter what trade you're in. The, the fundamental unit of an estimate is the quantities. Uh, now, that's where we tag all of our labor to, you know, whether it's tile flooring per square foot or drywall per square foot. You know, we, we have all of our labor values for that, whether it's a plug box or, you know, a piece of pipe, doesn't matter. The fundamental unit is that quantity. So you have to quantify these drawings. Um, so working in a completely digital workflow allows you to combine all of those steps together. So you've got your labor, you've got your material costs, you all tag, pre-tag to those quantities. So the moment you start to quantify it, like you say, I need to take off a wall. Like the, the fun one these days is the, the trades are going so nuts due to lack of labor. That's a um, big one. That's always going to be a big one. It, and it's, it's, it's been particularly rough in the last, I'd say, few years. Um, you know, everybody was screaming when I was in school about, you know, the trades people are going to retire. Well, they did. But let's be honest, we actually drove them a lot further than I thought. We would. Like some of my yeah. mentors retired in their 70s. Yeah. And so now we're actually seeing the, the wave of that. Um, it was just a little later than, than I 
thought it was going to be. Um, so now you, if you're a general contractor, for example, good luck getting a quote for drywall. If you don't actually submit the quantities you want to the drywall subtrade, they literally don't have time. They've got so many jobs on the go that it doesn't matter, especially if they're good. Um, it doesn't matter. They're just not going to price you. So a lot of this takeoff and quantification, especially in the trades, is now being done at the general contractor level. Like they will go and do their own square foots for flooring and do their own square foots for, you know, drywall and then submit that to the contract. And that's just by and frustration, right? Basically. It is. That's yeah, all it's just it is. pure necessity. They're the only guys that have the resources for it right yeah. now. Um, and I mean, if you're doing your due diligence as a GC, you should always do on some level a quantification of the job just so you can tell if what you're getting back actually yeah. makes sense. Yeah. But the m and &E is so complex, that's just not feasible. Um, there, you know, the, the GC consolidates the whole project together, but the m and &E are this is the reason why they're called kind of the prime trades. Yeah. Their, their job is so complicated, they have to do that in-house no matter what. And so in, sorry, you were going to say something? I was just going to say that, I mean, the m and &E, it actually is so true because they're making profit based on everything that's being performed. So you're yeah. lo running a line or a dedicated switch or a dedicated, whatever, everything has an incremental profit attached to all of it. If you that, miss one little thing, you're yeah. losing profit at that time. 100%. So yeah, and that's the reason why it's so critical for a business owner, yes. And there's, there's so many fiddly bits. Um, like we, you've got to count thousands of items in in these m and &E projects um, for an average size project and then it just scales exponentially from there like when you look at the room around you and you look every little plug yep. every light fixture yep. somebody counted that what's actually the worst is usually probably five people counted that um, <laughs> <laughs> it's you, true it's very very think true about it, i know <laughs> Is very and it's then it's also ridiculous. every fixture is also component attached too. So there's also yeah. other elements that are attached to it. And then yeah. there's takeoff on spools of whatever material you need, and you have to figure that out. It's, yeah. And then we also have to factor in, I guess, uh, increases in suppliers and costs, and trying to figure well, out. Well, that's, that's yeah, that's a, that's a whole, whole other different I know, risk analysis. I know. And this is this is why you know drywallers, you know, some of that kind of stuff, depending on the size of the project, can often get away on more negotiated um, cost plus contracts, that sort of thing. But nobody will ever give an ounce or an inch to the M&E nope. because there's too much risk. Yep. There is just so much risk in there if something goes sideways. Uh, and, and what you said there, material costs, absolutely huge. You know, the drywaller effectively has two, maybe three materials that they're dealing with, you know, five eighths or half inch drywall. And then, you know, maybe some extra miscellaneous stud material uh, and screws. So I, would, I would love to people to understand all the tradespeople that are listening that are not electrical or mechanical or plumbers to understand yeah. when you go shopping and you put an order in or you submit it to your supplier and then all of a sudden that cart arrives or the carts arrive with all that material, it is almost like a mini store that's being placed inside of your work vehicle. And then that's the amount of components that you have attached for one project, for one yeah. project. I know. <clears throat> but when you look at the M&E trades, for example, they have hundreds of different materials yeah. for a singular project. Yes. Like they're, That's why when you open up an M&E van, it is a fully stocked mini Home Depot on wheels. Um, it's and true. You've got, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you've got a tool for all of that. Like on top of that, so you often see when these guys roll in, the, the M&E guys roll into a, a mid-sized project with several seat containers, and that's just their tools and consumables uh, yeah, I know. for that project. Yeah, and crazy. so like the, the mechanical guys alone on, you know, three different systems will have plastic pipe, they'll have the black ABS, they'll have the white PVC, then they have the copper, then they've got the D-Dell, like they, they've got 
all these different, and then you've got stainless, you know, what's fittings, fittings for everything, then, glues for everything, got all the different fittings, uh, blades and then for you everything. Get into I know electrical. Everything. Yeah. You've got, you know, your wire, your morettes, your screws, your like, <laughs> it's just, see Melvin, psychotic. this is why I am not one of them because, but the guys <laughs> that are really good at it, they love that. They love that organizational. Oh, oh, I think them. they actually I know. hate it to be perfectly Do honest. No, the ones I know love it. They love that. They basically they can walk into the it. van, send the trade, send the journey person. To go in there and go get me this and get me that because yes it's all oh yeah yeah what's yeah. it's once organized in execution, yes. yes yes and you've got that you know a little bit of ocd in your your personality you will do very well yes. in the trades like m and e um but the estimating side of it it's it's crazy because you know the all the trades get the same amount of time to fit regardless yeah. of the complexity yeah so you know on that large job the carpenters, the drywallers, everybody gets the same, but the estimates for the mechanical and electrical guys will be a fantastically higher amount of effort to, to put together. Very true. Um, and so that's why we started there with the software. It's also where the software provides the greatest benefit. So I ran some stats on, you know, M&E estimating. So in a job where the mechanical and electrical guys purchase their own equipment, so, you know, they're allowed to buy all of the switch gear, the lights, you know, the generators, blah, blah, blah. Um, they will spend 80 to 90% of the time on the bid counting widgets that only contribute 20 to 25% of the final cost. Really? Like, yes, it's shockingly terrible wow. time versus money investment. Now, you have to get it right. But it is a deeply painful task to tune out. And the margins are so tight these days um, that you you have to nail this down. So you have to count every light fixture. You have to count every plug box. Um, <clears throat> so how do, you, how do you do that effectively in anything but a digital process now? Um, once you scale above about $100,000, there is no actual way to physically do that in the time constraints. So, and I mean like a hundred thousand dollar electrical. Package. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, yeah. you know, that would be a potentially $500,000 overall project. Um, but I, so that's where you guys come in now. Yes, exactly. And so how, so do, how do we get them? Because I can assume the construction's old dogs. It's just that old dog's mentality. Even though you're young, it's an old dog mentality. We've been doing it, and we joke about the, the piece of plywood, the piece of whatever. We joke about all that stuff. But they yeah. have to really, I agree with you 100%, get rid of the paper. No more paper. <laughs> so how do you guys start with them? How do you, where does that so fit? We start? literally show them. Like, we're like, okay, let's sit down and do a demo here. Let's organize a time where we can sit down and show you the process kind of from start to finish. Um and, you know, a few guys are familiar with software nowadays. I mean, it's been unavoidable. Most contractors nowadays use at least Bluebeam, um, which is a, you know, glorified PDF. Editor. Well, it's funny, Melvin. I'll just I'll interrupt you just briefly. Is, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. kind of funny that when I first started in social media seven, eight years ago, I had a big question. Do contractors even own smartphones? Do they even know how yeah. to use smartphones? And that was a question yeah. I didn't have an answer for, but I quickly learned within months every single tradesperson had a smartphone whether yes. or not they can use all the apps and they can use everything that's attached to that smartphone that's a different story but they had Correct. Them. so basically yeah. they had the they had the tools in front of them the digital tools yeah. in front of them and then yeah. we, we they were just slower to adopt that's all it yeah. was and and this is like you every single trades contractor now has a computer yes of some sort yes like uh, uh, and so one of the cores with the software that we built was to go cloud native so that it didn't matter what kind of computer you had. Like you can run this on a Chrome rocket stick. You literally do that at the trade shows because it's the easiest. Yeah. Um, or whatever you want. The, the only key nuance that, that I've noticed here, screen size matters. Okay. <clears throat> um, so a lot of guys who have tried digital before and had a bad taste have typically tried it on their laptop have typically tried it on something, you know, small, maybe, maybe a, a desktop screen. But if you hold a 24 by 36 inch drawing up to that, that laptop can see the title block. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And so the core 
piece, if I can stress anything in the digital workflow. You need a 48 inch screen, it has to be the 4K resolution. What that does is because of screen dimensions, a 48 inch screen gives you that 24 by 36 sheet size at one to one scale. And then the 4K gives is roughly the same resolution your eye can see at. And so that gives you every note, every piece of text. There is no more zooming, there's no scrolling. And so it gives you the whole field of view on the project. Um, Melvin, am, am I fair to say that that's not a problem in construction because of gamers? I know a lot well, of trades. That's actually the key limiting factor. Yeah. That's what it's, it's interesting. It's the, it, these screens are so cheap. Yeah. And nobody's actually really held that drawing up to their laptop screen and made that connection. Like it, or not, not a lot of people, especially yeah. if, you know, the laptop was really just there for billing and handling emails. Um, <clears throat> once you, you make that connection, and this is what this last year, we've gone from Ontario out to BC down to Texas championing this. And the feedback we've had has been fantastic. The number of people in the audience that have stepped up afterwards and said, you know what, I went right out, bought myself this screen. And yeah, that alone has made it far easier to, to actually see. And you know, we were all told by our moms growing up, don't sit that close to the screen. <laughs> and you literally could never watch a video like that. It's yes. too close. Yeah. But it's the same as watching a drawing. Nothing's moving. It's the same as reading a drawing. But the moment you're clicking on something on it now with, say, you know, our Pad a Big Quantify platform, the moment you count that plug fixture on there, it's tying everything together for you. It's putting in your labor, your material. So now you've, you've taken all the back end part of that estimate compressed it into one thing and now as a, a another side effect of that all of your data is now tied right back to that drawing so if it's not on that drawing it is not in your estimate it's that simple it's protection There's no more argument it's yes it's, it's serious protection it is huge protection because then what we're telling all of our clients and we build into the platform export the drawing and send it with your quote yeah send it along so that they know exactly what they are getting. Um, I started doing that again early on in my career as an estimator. I would dump out the drawings. I would have them all marked up, send them. And I literally had uh, a 50-50 feedback from the general contractors. 50% called me up on the day of closing and said, this is amazing. We love you. Everything's crystal clear now. This is awesome. The other 50% called me back and said, what the hell are you trying to do to us? You're trying <laughs> to screw us. I'm like, no, I'm trying to stop you from screwing me. And now yes. I get it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so really interesting when you start to do that. Um, and we, we had a client just, uh, this is uh, back in the summer, um, closing a job. It was 1030 at night on a, a Friday. And he calls me. He's like, okay, you know, with your software, you know, want to see, you know, how to close everything out here. So I walked him through the closeout. I'm like, man, export the drawing. You've done this whole nice drawing of this house. It shows everything on there, all the plugs, all the lights, export. He was asking, he's like, why would I do that? I'm like, because two reasons. One, it will protect you. Two, you will be the only electrical on this job. I guarantee that does this. And he was like, okay, so he did it. He calls me Saturday morning. He's like, the client has already called me back. I have the job. I am to start on site on Monday. Done. Done. That's <laughs> all you like, needed to do. Yeah. And so that's where that actually um, changed the game for us a little bit with our platform. We're like, okay, we really need to start to integrate all the data into the estimate that we can. So in our platform, we started to roll shop drawings in. We started to roll the ability to do drafting into it all of these these features around okay let's make that that initial estimate the true starting point of the project so when when the contractor when the trade has put together their bid they can dump out the shop drawings yeah and just attach them right to the quote yeah so huge when you're doing design build you know you can now literally say here's what you're getting pick your color it's, that's what it is, right? So let me, yeah. Melvin, let me take, we're going to do a little history here. And then I want you to dive sure. deep into the actual 
software and how it all yeah. works for everybody, right? So uh, average hourly earnings for construction workers in Canadian dollars uh, back in 2001, what do you think the average uh, construction worker was making in Ontario? Back in 2001? Yeah. Two decades we're talking. What, what, uh, okay, does that, like, trade class? Like, uh, yeah, that's true. So I guess it's a medium at this point. So, I mean, Ontario was 21 bucks an hour. The Canada average was 21 oh, bucks. Like Highest wow. was Alberta. You guys, you guys were at 27.50. And then okay. lowest, yeah, lowest was Newfoundland at 14. That's so, why they all came to Alberta. <laughs> so in 2005, we had a slight jump. Ontario was $23.50. Canada's average was 22.50. Alberta again had the highest at twenty four fifty. So you guys had a reduction, a tiny bit, and then New yep. Brunswick had the lowest at seventeen fifty. In 2010, tw Ontario was at twenty five fifty, uh, not much. Canada was the average was twenty six fifty. Alberta was still at the top at thirty fifty. You guys had a huge pay raise <laughs> there. La New Brunswick was lowest at eighteen fifty. In twenty fifteen, Ontario was at twenty seven. Canada's average was twenty nine. Newfoundland was the highest at twenty eight fifty. And then lowest wow. was Manitoba at twenty six fifty. And then as recent as twenty twenty one, Ontario is at thirty one fifty. Canada, the average is thirty two fifty. Highest right now is Quebec at thirty six bucks an hour. And then the lowest is Manitoba at thirty one bucks an hour. So I yep. thought that was kind of interesting to to know. I, that. I'm surprised that Manitoba is the lowest. Is, um, yeah, that's a little surprising. Yeah, to, uh, yeah I think that at as least well. in the the M and E realm, Saskatchewan has yeah. typically been been the lowest in our experience. So we're chatting with Melvin and uh, Patabit here. It's www.patabit.com. Melvin at patabit.com uh, for his email, and then on Instagram, it's Patabit Tech. And then on, they're also on LinkedIn. They also have a YouTube channel. So actually, we're going to talk a little bit about that YouTube video. Um, because I was watching it and it made sense to me and I'm not that trade. I get it. That's why <laughs> one of my first questions to you, Melvin, was it's totally, you can convert this to other trades, man. Like this is totally 100%, 100% yeah, that, right? That is the end goal. Yeah. 100%. I would love to see all the trades <clears throat> handling something like this and working it because this is just making them more money, less yes. work hours, more money. Yeah. Isn't that what we're always trying to go after? 100% the end game and reduce the risk. Yeah. Because you don't want to lose that money. <laughs> like it, the misunderstandings, what, what right? Quote and quote. Make, yes. Yeah. Yes. We <laughs> make, know. you know, money on 10 of the projects and then lose it all on one. No. No. Like that's 100% uh, what we, we want to avoid here. So, yeah. Um, I don't know. How do you want to go about this? Do I don't know. How can we? I know that everyone, I mean, they're watching and they're listening, but I guess. Um, most of the people are listening. I guess we can just kind of verbally walk them through and how it all works. We yeah, get a bid, okay. we start, and then the process and the steps. I know you don't want to dive into the, the video is about a half hour long, but it's not that yeah. long when you're actually watching. It goes by fast because it actually clearly shows you how easy it is to do it. And there's there's a lot in there. That's, yes, that's why yes. like even it's a great we video to too. To show it. Yes, yeah. There there's a lot in there. So step one, I'll say you go and create an account at quantify.patabit.com or go to our website. It'll redirect you to the application. Um, and you, you create a, an account. Uh, the moment a user signs up, they automatically get a two week completely free, no credit card trial. What we, what we like to do though, is work with the contractor to make sure that they have time to do a bid in there. Um, and that's kind of the, the trial that we have. Uh, and then you create an estimate in the platform. So when you first log in, you're met with the estimate screen. You go ahead, create your estimate. I like to personally recommend organize them by year, you know, put a nice folder structure in, that kind of stuff. But that's just my OCD kicking in. Um, <clears throat> you create the estimate, then you drag and drop your documents in. So you bring in your drawings, you can bring in your specs. As long as it's in PDF format, you can drag and drop that right into your estimate. And the goal here is to make sure that all of the knowledge of that bid that you're putting together is centralized okay. so that you don't lose anything. You know, you're not going to lose paper here that you did your takeoff on. You're not going to lose sheets of stuff, et cetera, et cetera. When you close that job and six weeks later you find out you won it, you can come right back and all your knowledge is right still there. there. Nobody's, exactly. cha nobody's changed it. It, nobody's changed it. It hasn't fallen off the back of the desk. It wasn't put in the blue bin. 
No. And, you know, you're good to go. Um, so once you have that, then you open the estimate and start your, your grind on it, the, the actual meat and potatoes work on it. Uh, and this is where you, you start your takeoff. Um, so you've got, you know, your whole down the left-hand side, your navigation, you've got your drawings, your uh, assemblies, your items, databases, and your breakdowns. These are all kind of common features in there. Um, our items database out of the box has about 35,000 items in it right now. Oh, just man. to give you an idea, you're, this you're covering is, yeah, all the bases at that point. Just M and E. Wow. So, like, it's it, there's a, a tiny bit of GC that we've started putting in there yeah. for you know the design build side of things. So you got walls now if you want, <laughs> but uh, wow. But like, it's psychotic the amount of items in mechanical and electrical. So we're sitting at you know thirty five thousand roughly in there right now. Um, and then we have a bunch of pre-built assemblies that come out of the box also. Uh, and this is, this is absolutely crucial, especially for the m and &E because it takes way too long to set that up yourself. Um, so we're trying to get everything kind of working out of the box. Um, and then we have, you know, your drawings open up, your documents in there. We've built in um, uh, a PDF extraction and merge tool so that, you know, you can very quickly take your documents chunk them up and send them out for pricing okay. right away. So okay. when you're the prime, uh, you know, M and E trade, you have to send out for pricing on all your equipment. So whether that's HVAC, whether that's plumbing, whether that's all your switch gear and lighting packages, yeah. you've got to start getting that out early so that all of your suppliers have time to pull their quotes together. Um, so we built that right in again and it stores all of that. So when you chunk up the files in there, it keeps them so that you can come back later on and retransmit them if you need to. Um, and then you start your takeoff. And we've built uh, an AI into the back of the system because our, our key is we want everything to be as fast and streamlined as possible at this stage because that's where the, the lines share the savings are. Yeah. So if you've got you know a set of drawings for a commercial building, you can go in there and you can select your light fixture and say, count all these. It sends that back to our server farm that does the counts for you. And then you can queue that up. So you can start with, you know, one type of light fixture, then do the other type of light fixture. Wow. Go and yes, it takes, depending on which of our, our servers you hit, one of them is substantially faster than the other. It takes anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute to process a draw. And you can just keep queuing these up. So you, you, you know, select one fixture, you select one plug, you select one switch, and you say, go count all of these for me. You go make yourself a coffee, and in less than the time it takes for you to do the coffee, you come back, and it will have counted the vast majority of those. Holy. It's not 100% perfect. I will never attempt to claim that. Our goal is always 96% accuracy. But still, the, the, the alternative is us spending 10 times yes. the amount of time <clears throat> counting it yep. once, counting it yep. twice, asking the yep. apprentice to count it one more time and to make sure <laughs> exactly. that all three numbers are pretty close to each other. Yeah. So like the end goal is we humans are a tremendously judgmental species. <laughs> we are fantastic at seeing mistakes made by someone or something else. We're yes. terrible at seeing our own. Yes. So by having the AI do the first pass at you, it goes so much faster to see, okay, it missed that plug there. I'm just going to copy and paste the plug on there. It's good. It's now it. And so, you know, my record is 131 plugs taken off in 25 seconds. Um, That's insane. And that was out That's of the, the 146 total that were on the draw. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it becomes much more of a QA check than a brute force. And we, we developed the whole algorithm for this in-house because there, there's other pattern recognition algorithms out there. Um, you know, Bluebeam has one, you know, they all have this, but they have um, really annoying edge cases where like if you've got a wall that is, you know, some architect's dream and has to be at a 32.65 degree angle, they won't pick up anything on that wall. Okay. It, it, you can get into the math of why, um, but there is a whole bunch of mathematical reasons why they can't. We went and built our own specifically to um, sustain that, like to survive that and see through that. Um, and that's where, you know, because a, a, a few people in the industry have experience with these and they, they come to us and they say, well, you're no better than anyone else. I'm like, 
throw me a drawing. So they send it over, run it on there, and they always try to pick the drawing that he won some architect's award because yeah. of the curved walls. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, want, they want to test you, man. Yeah, I picking know. it up and they're like, how did you do that? <laughs> I'm like, So it's yeah, not the same. Basically, what you're saying is not the same. The accuracy is much better. Okay. Exactly. Okay. That's that's kind of the, the unique sauce there. And we're always trying to improve it. We are always working to improve that. Like I said, our target is always 96% because I figure four mistakes out of 100 is still better than the humans <laughs> doing. Um, <laughs> that's better than a piece of wood on the job site, okay? So uh, that's all that really matters. All right. So that's fascinating that you can do that. And, oh, yeah. It's, it's fantastic. And then... The flip side of it is, let's say you get that drawing that has nothing on it. You know, it's a, it is a design build. You're given, you know, maybe a floor plan or literally nothing. Um, and you have to go on site and take your own measurements. Well, that's where we built in the drafting module. It is not an AutoCAD replacement. I will be fully transparent. We are not trying to take on AutoCAD or Revit. What this is, is to make really fantastic looking napkin sketches. And, but as you're doing that, so like you go and you draw it out and you start putting your plugs in, you start putting your fixtures in, you start putting those pieces in on here. And we've got all the tools to do that in our library. It's building the estimate for you at the same time. So you, you draw your plugs in and all of a sudden you've got a hundred hours in there now. You've got all those pieces built in there. And the moment you take off a plug in our platform, it's not just bringing, or you draw it or you take it off, doesn't matter. It's not bringing in just a plug. No, it's bringing in the device box. It's bringing in everything's assemblies. It's bringing in the drop of wire down to it, the device, the faceplate, even the screws and morettes for it, because that's what's needed to do the job accurately. So when you're done, you get a total bill of materials for whatever you've either drawn or taken off. That's amazing, man. Yeah, it's, it, it is fantastic. And then, the other flip side of it is I have a severe fetish for data. For you what? Know, Sorry, for what? For data. Okay. And obviously, analytics. obviously, yes. like if you figured out how to do this, that's clearly <laughs> obvious for sure. It it, it, it it drives most people around me nuts. Um, so when you're done all of this, you have a fantastic amount of data and you have to slice that up usually. So if you're doing a, a larger size project, you might need to break it down by building. Like if you've got, you know, a multi-tower residential thing that you're working on, that sort of thing, you've got to break that down for the client. And so what we're building in here is all the tools needed to do that. So you get your one massive BOM at the end, but you can simply right click and say, show me what that BOM is per building. Show me what it is per room, per drawing. All of that is built in there. And then the system will take and massage that for you into your BOM per whatever you want. And it's doing it in real time. Like, that's the key. Melvin, so, let, let me ask you, Melvin, is it to the point where you want it to be? Is it, because right oh, now no. it sounds like no. it's fast. And, and I have this visualization where I can see a GC or I can see a trans person on a job site, has the drawings there, has given it to the journey person. And all of a sudden, they if they have a 4K TV somehow set up in their sprinter van, I can see that they can literally walk in the side of the van, have the drawings right there. And by the time they walk right back out the van, they already have the, the grocery list that they what they need for the job. Oh the man. Done. Yeah. Like but you're not you're nowhere near as fast as you want this to be yet. No, I'm nowhere near as like I want to dominate the full front end of construction. Like I want this to be tuned fully out so that you can know as a contractor how you're performing in your front end of business, what you're doing. I want you to be I mean, my glorious purpose, if you will, uh, to borrow from the Loki, the god of chaos, um, <laughs> is uh, <clears throat> I want within five minutes of a project coming out to know what your chances of winning are and what your price is most likely going to be. Now, I don't know if I'm ever going to get there, to be honest. Like, we're, we're building an analytics engine into the back end of our platform to tell our contractors, you know, after about a year's worth of work in the platform, it will be able to, if you track, you know, your stats in it, it will start to be able to tell you much earlier on in the, in the life cycle of a bid, whether you're going to win it or not. And so if you have, you know, multiple things to bid on, you can make a strategic choice and say, okay, 
you know, I only have a 35% chance of winning this one, whereas based on all of the performance metrics that the system tracks, I have a 60 or 40 or whatever percent chance of winning this other one. They both close at the same time. I'm going to put all my effort into the one that I have the chance of winning. Melvin, let me ask you a data question. How much of being awarded the bid is time? How quickly you get back your estimate? Almost nothing. Like really? Like truly at the end of the day, almost nothing. So it doesn't factor in at all? <clears throat> no. All that matters is your price. Okay. Who your competition is. Okay. That is the number one driver on whether this is what we've identified on whether or not you're going to win it. Um, and you're, you know, especially in the private sector, um, your uniqueness. Like what, what did you deliver in that bid? What makes you stand that out? That you stand out. Yes. Um, so that's, that's a lot of what our platform is to enable you to deliver a differentiator. Um, and so that's, that's where the, the speed and everything comes in for volume. There is way more to bid out there than there are hours in the day. So that's where the, the speed comes in. Like the construction is entirely a stats game. Yeah. At its core, it is the most amazing game of poker. Um, so a lot of those techniques can actually be applied to construction. And that's where um, all of this data and stats can feed into tilting the table a little bit more in your direction. Your favor. And help sure. you make those stranger choices. <laughs> so data is the, um, really it's the root of success in construction. And that's another thing that, you know, people are just starting to grasp now. And they're, they're grasping it at the, the large companies. Um, so, you know, your Black and McDonald's, your Modern Niagara's, your PCLs, your Grand Construction, these people are starting now to deploy data analytics. But even then, there's not a lot of um, full appreciation for what this can do. Um, it, it, the grand scheme of things. Uh, what I loved about the early digital system that I employed in this, you know, multinational company, the IT department um, screwed up, didn't fully secure the database server. Okay. Um, I was able to log into it and pull analytics for the whole company and then deliver that back to them and say like, okay, here's where we are winning and losing across the spectrum. Here's where like location-wise, all of our subject matter experts are based literally on the front end of that business. And then it was even better when I'm like, here's where you're getting screwed by suppliers. And so, you know, this company had national agreements on material with wow. suppliers. Yeah. And yet I was able to pull out of the, just from the estimates, okay, it would actually be cheaper for us to buy material in Toronto and ship it to Saskatchewan. And so based on that, you know, a bunch of the PMs were able to go back to the supplier and say, what are you doing? We have agreements that say you're not going to do this. <laughs> and then the supplier was like, how did you figure this out? And there was a whole bunch of horror that went yeah. back and forth. And I'm like, this is the power of data analytics. Um, and when you go in with a, uh, I would suggest, naive look so that you're not biased, it's amazing what you can start to pull out fine. Um and so that is, you know, the next level for what we're building into our application. So Melvin, based on your data and your analytics, I know for a fact in my custom resident, residential world, mm -hmm. it's always been a notepad and scratches on it, right? Mm -hmm. I have yet yeah. to see mechanical or electrical or plumbing or anybody come in digitally and speak to me digitally regarding those drawings. Yeah. I'll see some sort of digital component when it comes into maybe fine cabinetry and um, millwork and things like that in there because they're just drawing this attached to it. But they don't, they don't really use it for a cost comparison or cost estimating process. Has the commercial and industrial high res, have they kind of adopted this or am I also assuming that they're not, they might be as flashy as just a tablet, which is basically just a paper version of what they're currently doing. So it's, it's a little bit of a spectrum there. So industrial is the extreme spectrum. There is almost, I would argue, nothing to actually bid in industrial. 
Okay. They literally pay millions upon millions of dollars to their engineering teams to design their, they're all done in 3D now and they will take a full refinery plan and that will come out as a bill of materials. Done. That bill of materials Finish. has every inch, every nut, every bolt accounted for. That is submitted to the contractor to bid. So what the contract is actually bidding on, it's it's wonderful. It's the, you know, it, it's a really unique um, way of doing it. Um, <clears throat> That contractor, all the contractors are bidding the identical BOM. So there's now no mistake to be made in the quantification. Okay. If you screw up, you know, extending your BOM, then you really did something wrong. Um, <clears throat> but that is the extreme case in that direction. What you're doing as a contractor then is pure risk analysis. So it's a fundamentally different way of estimating. That's why taking a true industrial estimator and trying to slot them into a commercial project is very difficult. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's now, for the commercial easier. side, high rise. Yeah. So in that respect, you're getting detailed drawings. Like you do get detailed drawings um, for most things to the contractor. Yes. The contractors give nothing back except for a scope letter. Like there is nothing right now that comes back in the design build. The contractor still demands an architectural layout. And what you'll get back is that marked up. A really refined contractor right now may use something like Bluebeam to go and do some markups to show kind of what they've got in there. But more often than not, that process is so slow. The time crunch is so severe. You're getting pencil notes in that said, I carried six months in this room. Is it still a better guesstimation at that point, though? It's just a slightly better? It is a better guesstimate. Okay. All right. Yeah. And the the whole idea here is to get the information back to the GC so they know what you've done. They can go back to the owner, verify that this is acceptable, or if the owner wants to make changes. I mean, when you start to get into multifamily high-rises, those are always a different affair because you've got the base building and then you've got the tenant, you know, fit-ups. And tenant fit-ups are an endless train of change orders. Yeah. Because regardless of what the um, facility manager or developer has put in there as a standard, every owner has their own idea. So this is really where being able to, within 30 seconds, dump out the shop drawings for what you've carried and show that owner. It's like, here is because some owners are, they want a certain style of plug. Yeah. They want a certain color of plug. And that matters very deeply to them. And they will literally not care what it takes to put that in. That's what it is. I mean, I myself have been that owner once when I was building a garage. I wanted red plugs with stainless steel paste plates. I was an idiot. I had, you know, uh, both my wife and I were working. We had no kids. We were building the garage, you know, ourselves. But wait a minute. Red plugs with stainless steel. That's actually kind of cool looking. Yeah, the problem comes in with what a red plug is. And oh, you start really getting into fire code and everything. Yes. No, no. Like the, the only plugs that are allowed to be red are hospital grade, isolated ground, psychotic plugs. But again, having no kids, having nothing, <laughs> I didn't really pay attention to the bill until I came out west here. And I'm like, I want to do this again in my garage. But this time I had kids and yes. we had moved. And I go to buy this red plug. That red plug was $45 each. Ouch. <laughs> Where Ouch. It was like, okay, now I'm going for the $2 one I can get at Home Depot. <laughs> and a can of crayon. Yeah, <laughs> yes, like a plastic exactly. paint. That's exactly it. The finished yeah. product was fantastic in that garage with yeah. the red plugs and stainless steel <laughs> place plates. But I would never be able to do that again, justifiably. <laughs> so going from high-rise commercial, now we're filtering right down to the last segment, which is the custom resi. Um, <laughs> yes. Right. So they always want the new bells and whistles and they want new ways of trying to figure out how we can make more profit. That's and that is literally why we have this graph module. Now we have three or four key resi uh, clients on our platform and like three of them came to us in one week and they're all from different parts of Canada. And they're like, we need to be, uh, we like how you can mark up the drawings, but we're getting just these floor plans. Like, you know, from Minto or from, you know, Tamarack, we get a floor plan and we have to go fill everything in. 
can you help us? And we're like, wow, yes, we're, we're, we're literally so close to the solution right now. Give us a couple of weeks. And within two weeks, we were able to turn it around and say, okay, now you can actually go and lay all your plugs in by their symbols. You can upload your own symbol library if you have something really esoteric. Um, you can put all of your circuits in. You can do all of this as you're drawing it in, like you would on an app sketch on your big screen. You are literally generating the final price as you're going along. So they go and do this, and it takes them now, you know, 45 minutes to an hour to do this on a layout. Whereas before, by the time you did the nap and sketch, then you filled out the paperwork, they, it was a day or two. So this is what the guys are loving. It's the sheer speed they can do this. And then it's being done on your your own title block. Yeah. We have a title block in there. You can load up your own company's title block. And then you can submit that drawing with your quote. And you've actually done your quote at least two to three times faster in at least two to three times more detail. And you have a finished product that actually looks more or less like a digital CAD drawing that you can turn over to the owner and say, how does this look? Isn't that ultimately, Melvin, what we want as GCs and individual tradespeople's running businesses? Exactly. Like that, We're yeah. always dreading how much time in the back of our head we think an estimate's going to take. That yes, yeah, we're always that dreading that. We're we're we're, we're procrastinating. We're trying to figure out. <laughs> I'll get to it this weekend when I don't have the kids, or I've got no yard work to do. I got nothing. Yeah. I got I got or a between good, the hours of ten and exactly. Midnight. Yeah, in the yeah. evening before I go to sleep, or when I wake up, or in between this job, or when this is going to happen. Like we're always trying to carve out those opportunities of time, and then yeah. it just keeps getting pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. And that's all we do. And then it just gets worse. We're like, good at that. We're great estimate. at that. Yeah. We're very, exactly. I know. So what we want is to literally gut that time content. Like we want that to be as fast as possible while maintaining the accuracy. Like there's, there's usually perceived a time accuracy trade-off. I disagree with that. I think with today's technology, we're able to actually improve the accuracy while reducing the time. And we're, we're pushing this to the limit. Like we've got, um, in the background, some other AIs that we're, we're building on that will try to automate as much of this, like room identification, you know, wall wow. identification, all of these pieces entirely autonomously. We actually had that in the core product initially. We trialed it with a couple of people, freaked the living daylights out of them. Literally, they choked on it. They're like, nope, not ready for this. Don't like this. You know, really, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so we we stripped it all back a lot, but it's where the technology can go. It's going, and then it's, you get into going. the what was that? Sorry, no, no. It's where it's going. That's exactly it. Yeah. Is, yes, but it's going to take time on more of a social level to get there, societal level. I guess adapting. Like I mean, it, yes, I, I, yeah. I like we we just <clears throat> don't want to adapt that quickly. Exactly. And and we don't want to feel like it's taking the control out of our hands. Yes. Like yes. the key is to be ensure that, you know, I've always disagreed with the human machine interface paradigm. I believe the machine should adapt to the human. That is a way more difficult thing because we humans are <laughs> very difficult species. Yes. Um, Mother <laughs> nature can't adapt. To I us agree faster. with you, Melvin. <laughs> let me let me do a little OBC talk talking about yes. electricals here. So protecting electrical conduit, uh, conduit. Oh, conduits. All right. So applies to electrical conduits in commercial buildings and buildings of major occupancy, which serve. So we have fire alarm systems, we have emergency equipment, we have fire pumps, we have emergency lighting systems. Uh, these conductors must provide a circuit integrated rating of at least a one hour or be within a service space that does not contain any combustible material except for electrical conductor or is separated from the rest of the building by a fire separation with a rating of at least one hour. Everything's all applicable in that one hour window when I guess it goes to high rise and then also when it goes into single family dwellings that decide to go with rental properties and separations, it all applies the same thing. So um, Melvin, I wanna ask you, uh, what's the back end of this? What haven't you already expressed? Okay, I'm already uh, like amazed at the possibilities, and I'm just wondering: Am I getting scared that you guys are doing too much, and I'm going to be like overwhelmed by everything that is possible with it? Yeah, I mean that that is a common battle with all software development is to keep that user experience 
friendly and light friendly exactly. <laughs> and, and simplified our clients have been telling us to date we are by far the simplest one to use which is awesome because you know we have um i like to call it simplicity through or complexity through simplicity so we have for example a whole formula engine on the back end so you can use like excel formulas in our platform but that's not exposed or talked about unless you're a power user the moment you're a power user and you want to start to get into something really complex, you can. So we, we start at the simplest, you know, graphical takeoff. We've got quick item pads that give you all the icons there. So you know exactly what you're getting when you click on that, all of that. But let's say that you are a more advanced user of software doing more complex industrial projects. You might want to go and create, you know, table trade, you know, with, you know, filled in conduits. But then you're doing this and you're like, but I want to actually calculate my conduit fill according to building code. To do that, there's formulas. Okay, well now you can actually start to implement all of that in there and the user is given fine grain control over their data. And then any data that the user puts in is proprietary to themselves. Okay. Nobody else sees that. Yeah. So it's, um, I mean, depending how nerdy you want to get, at its core, it's a SQL database that we've um, hacked up to be semi-structured, um, ripping off a you know a ton of the, the concepts developed by Uber and um, some of the concepts developed by Facebook, um, <clears throat> just in like you know data storage, not in the somewhat sketchy things. They do. <laughs> <laughs> the other little things, but but what I love throughout this whole podcast that you've been talking about is that you're listening to the end user. That like, is the and, key. and that's key yeah. when it comes to construction. Yeah. Like we all honestly feel that we don't have a voice and then you're, you're, you're supplying something brand new to them and you're letting <laughs> yeah. them play with it. And then you're listening to what they like or dislike from it. Like the, the fundamental root of our development is what we call continuous development. So you will never see a version one or version two of this software. What you will get is, you know, monthly or every couple of months email that's telling you, the changes we've made. And so when a user comes to us and says, I need drafting, okay, we're working on that. You know, we plug that in for you. Our goal is always a two week turnaround on new requests. That is our goal. It really depends on how big of a request. So of like course, yeah. we've been asked for mobile, you know, right now um, for mobile viewers. So that one's been about six weeks and we're just about to release the initial incarnations of that. Um, and that goes to, you know, they want their superintendent on site to have read only direct access to what was bid. And so they can shape it and pull the bill of materials and that kind of information out of it. Um, could you melt? I just had a thought. Could you in theory, um, project it off a mobile device on a job site? You, what do you mean by that? Well, no, an actual projector. Use a use a portable like projector. Project the estimate. Yeah, or, yeah. Project the yeah. estimate. Project the drawings. Project whatever that yeah, your your absolutely. file. Absolutely. Yes. You could totally do that yes. on a job site. Yep. Yeah, on a job site. I would recommend again get the forty eight inch. No, no, I totally, totally. Yeah. Screen so that you've got the resolution there. But yeah. No, that's that's the idea here, right from your phone. My concern yeah. would be the plumbers would start gaming on the job site if you had a four K <laughs> TV. And while the mechanical and the electricals are trying to do their job, you know what I yes, mean? Yes, that's, that's... But I was just thinking, like, a, a projector. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think a projection would be kind of interesting to be on site, and then everybody's on the same page, literally. Yes. Yeah. No, you're you're hitting the nail on the head there. Um, and that is, that is kind of like one of the end goals of being able to implement this. Yes. And that's what continuous development enables you. You know, if... If a client comes to me and says, I want to be able to project this this way on site, yeah, give me a couple of weeks, I will do that for you. Um, we've just implemented a comprehensive closeout that we're continuing to work on to put things like um, your full manpower loading curves in there. Well, imagine being able to project wow. that on site yeah. and, and see, okay, here's where we are. Here's where we need to be. Yeah. I got to hire five more people or my S curve is going the wrong way. Exactly. Um, and that's, and then we want to feed that into everything else out there. Like if you're a Procore user, if you're a, you know, 
top builders use or any of these things, we want to feed that in so that you're, you're able to run your projects as you know how, but in a standardized methodology right from the S. And, and it doesn't matter how big you are. If you are a small residential owner operator, or if you are a massive, you know, multinational organization. So Melvin, it, it sounds it sounds like you're doing regular nine to five days, five days a That's week. That's a lie. Yeah, Sleep I know. I, I like it's <laughs> insane, man. It's a, it's endless what's going on. I'm already thinking about other ideas. I'm just thinking about what you can achieve and what you could pull off, and and the future of construction and what it's going to be like for us as people that are in the industry for tools like this. Yeah, having them in yeah. our arsenal, right? Yeah, one hundred percent. Yes, like it is. The, the future is unlimited. Like there is nothing that's impossible. You know, if you look back a hundred years ago, flight wasn't possible. No. It was a violation of all known laws of physics for humans to fly. We can get into an airplane right now and blast anywhere in the world. Um, you know, space exploration. A hundred years ago, they didn't know space was a thing. Yes. And like you, you look at what's there. So the number one thing that annoys me more than Anything else is when somebody says, this is impossible. It may not be economically achievable at this precise moment, but literally I don't think anything is impossible. And if you don't know something about something, that actually gives you an advantage in a lot of cases because you don't know what's not possible. But it so, also allows you to look at it differently too. Exactly. To decide. Um, the, the possible. Yeah. One of my favorite ones, like you're familiar with the Japanese Aim 6 Zero from World War II. Yeah. The Zero Fighter. Yeah. Like everybody knows that fighter. The history of that fighter is fascinating. The chief designer on it was, I can't, I might butcher his name, I'm sorry, Harakoshi? I can't pronounce that. I wouldn't know. Yeah, but he was basically a fresh grad out of school. Mitsubishi put him in charge of designing the Zero because he wouldn't know what wasn't possible. Yeah. And as a result, his like first successful massive airplane that was produced so vastly exceeded all expectations that for many, many years of World War II, the Americans could not actually accept that it could do what it could do. Like it had a 3,000 kilometer range when the American B-17 couldn't do that. And so like it wasn't tainted. It's not possible, it wasn't tainted. Yeah. So you, yeah, there was no, no bias. Exactly. There was nothing to get in the way of what's not possible. Um, so yeah, I'm just that curious. What else Melvin is like, what else are that on the back end? What else are we, you attaching to the software for us to be using automated pricing? That's a huge one that we're working on. So like okay. another thing that takes up a lot of time when you're compiling a bid, is literally getting the prices for what you need. Um, so we've got a couple of things in there that will uh, autonomously bring in pricing for you. Based how, do, on how do you do that with supply chains dramatically, especially the last two, three years, dramatically increasing, having, it, it almost became a joke. It was almost on a monthly basis. Oh supply man. So if you were increasing. an electrical contractor, my favorite quotes were Oh, copper. Wire, I'll, I'll just say the word copper, copper, <laughs> copper, <laughs> copper. <laughs> insane what actually, copper was before and what copper is and where copper's going copper, ironically in the last while wasn't the problem was what plastic. was it plastic plastic anything that was pvc so if you were an electrical contractor you could not for the life of you get pvc conduit to put in the slab what the resins and or something or like what was yes okay. it was that um so there was two things that compounded it COVID supply chain screw ups, yeah, hosed um, uh, the obtaining of the resin. But then there was the factory in Texas that caught fire. Yeah, I've tried to burn down. I'd, and somehow everybody missed that like 98% of the resin produced in North America came from this one factory. So one it was, it was place. This business opportunity yeah. lets you and I go and start a resin factory. Because in, apparently in that's Canada. A thing. In Canada. Yes, Why in can't Canada. I know? I know exactly. we should. Exactly. We so that that was a massive thing. So you could not get a quote for anything that had a PVC coating on it, whether that was wire or conduit, didn't matter. If it had a PVC coating on it, wow. your quote was valid for 24 hours. Wow. And you had to place the order within 24 hours to have a hope of getting delivery. So that, of course, is a problem when you're bidding a job that you're not going to hear back on. You don't know. Weeks. Yeah. 
Exactly. Wow. So there was, it was extremely difficult to hedge bets. And then now we're into the chip shortage issues. So anything that has a microchip in it is a massive problem today. And code changes recently that require AFI breakers for your house, they all have chips in them. And nobody can get them. They're all back ordered or like, how do we, sp- I don't the Yeah. Like Schneider and Levitin yeah. can't actually produce them right now. Cause the chips. Um, they've got all the housings. They've got all the fiddly bits. They cannot get the one circuit board that actually runs it. Wow. Um, so that's the other thing. I mean, part of the problem is the number one chip manufacturer in the world, TSMC, is bought and paid for by NVIDIA, Intel, and AMD. And they've all moved to new methods of production for all of their high-end chips that ironically don't work for things that go into breakers and cars. Um, because you don't want the fine, high performance. What you need is the thick longevity. Yes. So you actually want the wires like etched into the circuit boards to be thicker for a car's ABS braking chip. Yes. You want a 10 to 15 year old legacy production methodology for it. So what we then need to do is get together as a couple of provinces here. <laughs> we need to get a couple of billion dollars together. We need to go buy the secondhand fab processes off of TSMC yeah. and set those up here in Canada beside yeah. our resin it, it sounds like a plan, Melvin. It sounds like a plan. Honestly. I, I, I literally, again, you're talking to like an Uber nerd. I spent some time working on what the economics something like that yeah. is. Yeah. And there's a couple of key places in Canada where we could actually set that up and become a secondary source for the old I There's have no, no idea why here. we're not doing it. Uh, I know it's, why, but we should be doing we it. We all know why. Exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it would literally solve a lot of the problems. Do we um, want to Do we want to chat a little bit about, because I guess everybody that's listening is going to want to, they're curious about numbers and, and the costs yes. associated with this and how they can get in. And I know that at the beginning of the show, you talked about a free trial because you want to give them an opportunity yep. to test it. So you want to elaborate more on that? Yeah, so um, it's a cloud-based platform, right? So we charge by the you by the seat we call it. So it's it's a little bit unique. You can put as many users on our platform as you want, um, and then you purchase a set of licenses, whether that's one, two, whatever you want. That's however many people can use it at the same time. So they log in, they check out a license, they log out, the license goes back to your pool. And the idea here is, again, to help those small to mid-sized guys where the owner, you know, at night is doing the bid, but then he logs out so his foreman who, you know, is between jobs the next day can log in and continue the counts. Yeah. And so that's that's how we manage it at that level. It's $1,200 per license, uh, U.S. or $1,500 Canadian. So that's what we run at um, per seat, and you get everything in the application. We don't do adders. We don't do deducts. You get everything that we have and you get a voice in our development. So that's not crazy. Everything. Melvin. That's like, that's, that's very reasonable. Well, the, the, the core to that is um, we, we try to self host everything. Okay. Like we're, we use, you know, Amazon as, you know, kind of a front end, but the costs for Amazon's wonderful to develop something in super easy, super great, seemingly expensive to deploy it. Um, especially once you start to get people, that's how they hook. You. Oh, okay. um, so All the right. moment you get, you know, more reminds me of another industry, drugs. but okay. Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Vendor lock <in. laughs> um, So we built something that we can fail over to Amazon if needed, but we try to keep everything, you know, here in Canada. Right yes. Now. Yeah. Um, technically here in Alberta. Um, if you're outside of Canada and you have data retention, you know, necessary in the U S or anywhere else. Yeah. We can swap that over to Amazon, but, um, at its core, that's what allows us to be, uh, as cost effective as we are. So $1,500 Canadian, $1,200 U S per seat. And you can share that with however many people you want in your company. And we just want to help the industry. Like at the end of the day, we are here for those, you know, small to mid size and eventually enterprise clients getting enterprise clients on board. It is always a 
monstrous undertaking. So, and, that's, that, and, and honestly, yeah. these tradespeople shouldn't kid themselves. I mean, the, I think that they take a look at it, give it a try on one bid, and just see exactly how it's going to work, and if see exactly. if it fits, right? Yeah. If it if it doesn't work for you, I want to know why. Because yeah, I'll come back to you in six months and I've got it fixed. Exactly, and you can have another trial at it, and we're going to do that. That is kind of our commitment to the industry. We want to make your life better. That's the core, um, and work with you to do that. So how long? How's the how's the ride been, Melvin? How's it? I mean, from the time that you first Ooh. had that stack of estimates dropped in your face, and to, oh, to to now, how's that ride been for you, man? It has been one heck of a wild ride. So I started my career in Ottawa uh, and worked my way across Canada, um, and we live in a very very interesting country like what you can do in construction what you can be exposed to in north america is absolutely fantastic it has been just estimating has been such a fantastic career um and now getting into the software side of it and supporting uh, other estimators and people doing estimating hearing the challenges that people face and then like for me right now, the, the greatest kick is, you know, when I get that call from a guy, he's like, man, this would make my life so much better, you know, if I could have it do this drafting thing. Uh, you know. And then a couple of weeks later, turn around and say, hey, man, go log in. Tell me if this works for you. And then I get that call back, you know, a day or two or whatever later when they've had a chance to sit down and they're like, oh, crap, man, this is just like you've changed the game for yeah. me. I've never seen this. And more importantly, when I get that feedback, hey, you've done something that nobody else has done. You've talked to me. You've literally listened to my problem, and then you actually went and solved it. They're like, we're even happy that you just listened to us. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the good thing about contractors and tradespeople. We're always coming up with problems. And, and like, well, that's literally Constant. what we do for our life. Yeah. Like, our life is to solve problems. Yeah. And as a result, we have so many of our own. We carry the burdens of the owners, and then we have to deliver on them. Um, and it doesn't matter what trade you're in, like that is literally the, the nature of what we do in construction. And here in Canada, I mean, I've been in the core of the Chalk River nuclear plant, their actual nuke, yeah. been into the Darlington plant, been into a whole bunch of buildings you can't talk about around <laughs> Ottawa, um, <clears throat> been in, you know, plants out here in Alberta, all the way out to Vancouver doing crazy things like there's just, if you have even the remotest bent to understand how things work, construction in Canada is a fantastic career move. Yeah, if you will get exposed to things that normal people just simply don't know exist. Yeah. And, and the lessons learned, how yes. you understand how everything is working yeah. and why it's working that and way. My, one of my favorite ones, there's a, an awesome park in Ottawa, like downtown. Okay. You know, it's green space, you go play there. What people don't realize is the monstrous tank underneath it. And like, that's just there. And I stand there and there's only one little hatch in the corner of the park. It's the only access to this thing. And the company I was working for built it, like helped to, to build this thing. And I'm like, you look around, you're like, everybody here playing with their kids and everything, they have no idea what's under their feet. What's the size that's of the what tank? What's the size of the tank? Oh man, it was millions of, it's stormwater. Um, like a reservoir or something? Uh, yeah, but for emergency runoff. Okay. And so it has all these massive hydraulic gates inside this tank. Like the thing is, I forget how many, was it six, 50, 60 feet down, oh. like to the bottom. And then like, and it's all pillars. And like, you only see this kind of stuff in the, the shows where people go and check, you know, under cities, Caverns like all that like kind that. of stuff. And like the hydraulics and control system that run it. And I'm standing there and all these kids are playing and I'm like, I, I'm probably the only guy standing in this park right now that knows what's underneath here. And it would blow everybody's mind to know what they were standing on. Um, uh, that's what, what construction can do for you. Which I totally agree with. I want to do a little green book talk with you. And I just want to yeah. say, I'm sure there's a few things that are built underneath Ottawa that we really don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> there are. <yes. laughs> a little bit of safety talk here for uh, power line contact. Contact between equipment and power lines should be avoided at all costs, as we know, using minimum distance rules. So there's a lot of, I, I know we have a lot of cowboys in the industry and they love to 
bring in their booms a little too close to certain wires and things like that. So we just want to be cautious of that. Uh, should contact between equipment and power lines occur, follow these steps. Stay on the equipment. Uh, touching the ground, we all know what happens. Uh, keep others away. Obviously, have, a, have a, a second person working with you. Break contact if possible. Move equipment clear of power lines. This may not be feasible in the line if the line has been uh, welded on. Call utility. Uh, jump clear if forced. Uh, you, you have to bail and then report it. That's it. As simple jump as that. Jump with your legs together. Yes. Like yes. that's the key. Yeah. Like, yeah. Otherwise, jump you're jumping your and you're together. creating another yeah. problem after that, right? Yeah. So you, you won't talk about that problem afterwards, sadly. I want so triple w patabit.com, Melvin at patabit.com uh, for his email. Instagram is patabit tech on uh, Instagram, and then LinkedIn is also patabit. And uh, he's got a YouTube channel, which you'll love watching it. Um, did we cover everything, Melvin? Is there anything that we missed I that you want to share? So, uh, actually, speaking of the YouTube channel, um, my training session that I did at Nika on digital estimating has been uploaded there. So nice, recently. If you guys, yeah, like just in the last day. Okay, um, cool. It's a uh, take a look at always interested in people's feedback to find out if I'm on crack or, you know, <laughs> making sense. Um, if but, you're on uh, crack, you're the only one in construction that's on crack, right? <laughs> hey, I get high on data. That's enough for me. <laughs> But, no, uh, no, please check it out for sure. And also yeah. subscribe to the channel and you're going to learn a lot of stuff too, right? So, I mean, bottom line, this is really about making your business more profitable, making your life more efficient. And then mm -hmm. figuring out how you can actually use more time for yourself instead of constantly trying to figure out. Exactly. Yeah. And, and grow the business. That's it. Like uh, at the end of the day, healthy growth in your business, make sure that it's as accurate and um, ideally low risk as possible. Yeah. That's, that's a bit of an oxymoron to say in construction, but that's, that's the goal. That's <laughs> the goal. All right. We've got the 12 questions. You ready for this, man? Shoot me. What is your favorite construction word? I've got a guess, but. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite construction word? Estimate. That is my favorite, <laughs> favorite construction word. <laughs> what is your least favorite construction word? Commissioning. <laughs> what turns you on in construction? Data. What 100% you... the data. I can see that. I could. We've all been talking about it through the whole show. What turns you off in construction? Oh, sometimes the closed mindedness. Mm. Like that's, that's the, the challenge. Like why through. not? Like why not just and, try it? Yeah. And, and sometimes, I mean, it's, it's a human condition. Yeah. Like it's, I can't fault, you know, humanity for it's literally our nature, but that is probably there. There seems to be a lot more of it in construction um in some cases uh in some places but yeah, yeah that would be challenging. i agree uh what is your favorite curse word we haven't expressed any on this show we don't have to it's up to you definitely toronto that's it <laughs> <laughs> you know what i'm gonna agree with you on that one man totally Sorry, agree man. With you. no to i'm gonna agree with you on that one totally i love that <laughs> <laughs> Toronto. Uh, what is your favorite vehicle? Anything in the world? Uh, SR seventy one Blackbird. Yeah, airplane, ah. fastest air breathing airplane. Look Fantastic at that. Technology. Are you licensed? I uh, did. Yeah, but ages ago. Okay. Um, and, uh, well, I did ninety eight percent of my license, and then uh, wife's tuition came up, and we chose to invest in that. But uh, are you still going through still therapy for that one, or what? Uh, it's the bucket list, and we've got a, our airplane selected for when we can afford an airplane. Sure. And, yep. Sure. Yeah, SR-71, famous. Uh, uh, the guys who worked on the engine for that were uh, ex-employees of uh, the Iroquois engine for the Canadian Avro Aero. Really? And one of the only reasons why it succeeded was because we canceled the Avro Aero, and a bunch of its tech ended up in the um, J58P1s or the SR-71. Okay. And also the lead designer for the Avro Aero with, you know, with one of the lead designers for the Apollo space yeah, program. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. if you want a little bit of Canadian pride out of a lot of Canadian shame, our guys went and did some <laughs> awesome things after that. <laughs> what is your least favorite vehicle? Pedal bike, probably. A pedal Even bike? I, I do. I, I have a Cannondale. I 
did enjoy training, uh, trail riding, that kind of stuff. But if you can't tell these days, I don't do enough of that. So it's now become probably my least favorite mode of transport. Got it. <laughs> what construction sound or noise do you love? Who? I mean, this is just going to be super nerd. Mechanical keyboard has a cool sound. Yeah, it does. It actually <laughs> you could does. Argue that it, that's no, no, it does. Construction these yeah. days, yeah. but uh, um, yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, outside of that, I do love the sound of rock trucks. Like uh, when those things are going by, that is just a cool sound. And those big cats. That brings us back to lower. being a kid. That's all it does. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I had. Tonka trucks as a kid. Yeah, my son you, has the Tonka trucks yeah, out yeah, back. Yeah. You're and now a I don't kid. Want to You're a Tonka kid. Tonka That's all it is. <laughs> what construction sound or noise do you hate? Um, I am not a fan of die grinders. You know, use harsh. Them, that kind of thing. I know but the, that harsh squealing sound. That's always been a rough one for me. I yeah. know. <laughs> I know. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt one day, Melvin? Who? <clears throat> um would love astronaut that would be an interesting that was mine when i answered the yeah. questions man i totally <laughs> i totally would love to do that totally i would love to do that i mean or advanced nuclear physicist it's a tough toss up um maybe both <laughs> <laughs> what profession would you not like to do doctor yeah, I don't you know, know, I would love that it's a very noble profession. I have nothing against it. It's a wonderful profession, but I get, I, this morning I was so wiped out queasy just for my kids. The I kids, could eh? not handle that. <laughs> and the last question, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at those pearly gates? Well, I hope to be coming in on a ball of fire, you know, smoldering from the hair. And I hope to hear, well done, my good faith <laughs> servant. <laughs> I like the smoldering. I like the fire. I like yeah, the entrance. Wanna, yeah. Whatever life I'm given from heaven, nice. I want to live it to the absolute max. Nice, nice. And, and come blaze it in. And, yep, that's that would be it. That awesome. would be the dream. <laughs> awesome. Melvin, this has been a blast, man. Thank you so much for uh, sharing this so much. This has been awesome. Educating Thank you guys. me and the listeners. <clears throat> Like, I honestly. hope so. No, for and sure. And if you guys have any questions, uh, you got my email address there, contact yeah. information. Would love to hear from you guys. Nice, man. One last time, and, Melvin yeah. Newman. Uh, pa sorry, you were going to say something? Yep, no, go well, ahead. Uh, uh, Patabid, and it's uh, www.patabid.com, and it's Melvin at patabid.com, and on IG, it's Patabid Tech and LinkedIn, and also, also on YouTube. Thank you, man. Really appreciate it. Very good. All right. Thanks, Thanks Melvin. So Take much. care. We'll talk soon. Thanks very much, Angelina.